ISO, um, Toronto has a platinum status. That's the highest level of certification under ISO that you can get. We awarded that to Toronto just a few months ago in London at London City Hall with Boris Johnson hosting. That platinum certification is already a business opportunity. It's already a, a, a tool for Invest Toronto. We've been meeting with Councillor Thompson and others on this um, certification because as soon as you get that level of comparative data that we can compare ourselves to London, we can compare ourselves to Los Angeles, to Boston, to Shanghai, et cetera, the attractiveness for business, the tool that this data provides because it's apples to apples standardized data for the first time, we can look at greenhouse gas emissions, we can look at water consumption, electricity, et cetera, green cover, uh, green tr uh, tree cover, trees planted, PM 2.5, air quality, all of those become incredible instigators for uh, investment in Toronto, which is why Invest Toronto and others are, are helping to now to promote Toronto. And, uh, I can't agree more with the idea of a regional you know, boundary uh, issues because the Toronto urban region, when you aggregate the data up that we've been collecting for Vaughan, for Mississauga, for Toronto, et cetera, when you aggregate that data up to the whole Golden Horseshoe, which we call the Toronto urban region, we have data now that puts Toronto for example, with higher ed degrees, on par with um, the, um, the Bay Area, which is Silicon Valley, right? So <laughs> our, we are one of the highest educated populations in the world, uh, and we are close to Silicon Valley and the Bay Area. We're higher than the sh greater Chicago area when we aggregate the, the data to the Toronto urban region. So that kind of data, safety and resilience, et cetera, and an investable economy attracts SDI. So I can't underline the importance of data enough in this world of a very co interconnected global world in which we live as, city, as citizens of cities. Wonderful. Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> uh, moving on to Grant. And um, do you mind just passing the microphone? And I believe it works best if you speak into the top round part. If you're speaking to the side, it doesn't pick up your voice. Ice cream cone approach. Exactly. Okay. Got it. Okay, Grant. The Toronto Financial District BIA identified some of the many economic opportunities associated with resilience. How can we collaborate to achieve this? Great. Thanks very much. So, um, something I read in the spring, there was a report that came out from Mercer, an investment report. Very heavy tune, technical. Don't recommend you read it, so I'm going to summarize it very quickly for you. Uh, it was called Investing in a Time of Change, if you're interested. Investing in a Time of Climate Change. And what they did was they took a very pragmatic approach. They looked at several future scenarios in terms of uh, degrees change in, in average temperature and precipitation. And from that, they looked at a couple things. Number one was investment risk. So there they said, so what is going to happen in terms of different sectors of the economy as we transform to a low carbon economy? What I learned from that is don't buy coal mines. That was my takeaway. So I'll leave you that one. The second piece I thought was very interesting also, and they called it fragmentation. And their definition of that was that there's going to be damage to certain asset classes, and I understand that. I can see where going forward by 2050, certainly performance around things like agriculture, timber, are all going to be affected by climate change. We're fortunate, I think, a couple of our key sectors, like financial services, are pretty well protected because you know we work in buildings, there's not the same exposure. But I thought the one that was interesting, and this is really you know where part of my thinking is on this, is that in the case of real estate, you know, a lot of people are going to look to mitigate the impact of climate change by looking at their portfolio of real estate and making some choices as to what real estate they hold in a global portfolio. So, you know, what I want to point out is I believe that extreme weather is going to create winners and losers in terms of, you know, some cities that are going to gain a lot and some cities are going to lose. So, I think resilient infrastructure is going to be an investment that's going to help us be a winner. Now, as far as that goes, I'm going to speak a little, a bit longer on this because I think the councillor made a good point about the local aspect. So, um, you know, it's great that we have big regional ideas, but everything starts with a, a single step every journey. So a part of the role of our organization is we, we coordinate uh, city work with private properties. And we look to try and do that in such a way that the activity is mac or, uh, minimizes disruption, maximizes the benefit that the work is done once, it's done right, you know, basically giving everybody the biggest bang for the buck. One of the things that we've made a point of including on our checklist as we go and look at every, every project in our area, and it's right at the top of the checklist, it's not at the bottom, is infrastructure hardening opportunities. So a couple examples I'll give you very quickly. Like right now, we're working with Toronto Hydro and TTC to replace, uh, replace hydro poles uh, on King Street. 
And as part of that project, we're ensuring that as many as possible of the overhead lines are being buried underground. So when the next ice storm comes, you know, it may be only 1,000 meters we're dealing with, but it's 1,000 meters that we're not going to have a problem with. Another one right now, very quickly, we're working on is in 2017, they're going to be replacing the water main on Wellington Street in our area. We've gone, we've had the opportunity to work with the city staff and with the uh, private properties, and because we've been you know, far in advance in the conversation, the cities have been able to elect to change the servicing into their buildings. You know, very often I hear from the buildings, we spend a lot of money in terms of upgrading the systems of our buildings, but we're not always 100% sure what we're hooking into on the street. So what I want to point out here is that, you know, private buildings, commercial buildings are generally, to a large extent, held as part of a portfolio of buildings, not just one individual holding. So there's competition for the capital in those buildings. So what's really important as we talk about working together to harden our infrastructure is we start the conversations early, 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 as early as possible so people can get ahead of the curve on it, they can budget for it, they can plan for it, and we can minimize the disruption to everybody involved. Thank you. Sorry about the time. Thank you. Our next question is for Lucy. Lucy, what sectors can best support and collaborate to advance the community resilience hub concept? And we got a microphone? Yes, testing. Great. Um, thank you. So uh, in our project, um, can you bring that slide back up? Yep. Uh, we have been working uh, very closely with three main sectors. Call them sectors. Uh, the first is local community partners. The second are municipal partners. The third are emergency response players, and the fourth is educational partners. Um, to identify local community partners, uh, we've been working with this mapping tool, and what this does. So this mapping tool, and we this was developed in conjunction with the City of Toronto, their S the SSDA office. And this is a, a map of the, the, the broad pilot site, but each, uh, at each of the faith sites, uh, we also have a blown up map that provides the faith community participants, because we're starting with faith communities in this pilot project, uh, with the ability to identify other community partners, schools, libraries, food banks, health centers, other faith com communities. Um, we're also working very closely with a, a, a newly formed volunteer initiative called CREW, Community Resilience to Extreme Weather. Um, and this is an example of the grassroots response in Toronto uh, right now to help build up community resilience. And they're helping us to, uh, to extend our community partner networks. Um, the second sector are, is the city. We want to make sure that these uh, resilient hubs are adding value and complementing the work that the city is doing. Um, so we're working with the Office of Emergency Management. I mentioned the SFDA. We're working with the Environment and Energy Division. And we're working with um, uh, Toronto Public Health. And of course, the um, uh, I, I guess I already mentioned the Environment and Ener Energy <coughs> Division. So again, um, community resilience is about um, adding value. And then finally, we have a host of fantastic training and educational partners, the Salvation Army. Um, and this picture down here, by the way, the picture up there is the, the volunteer team of crew, but this picture <laughs> over here is um, a Salvation Army training session at Trinity St. Paul. Uh, so they are they're helping us conduct emergency preparedness workshops. The Red Cross is vetting, uh, helping us vet uh, uh, an emergency preparedness uh, toolkit. University of Toronto graduate students are helping us do a cost of business analysis. Um, and finally, ECLEI, which is local governments for sustainability, are linking us with regional climate adaptation um, networks. So in short, it's all hands on deck. We can do this. Thanks, Thanks Lucy. <laughs> and finally, Shauna. What is unique about resilience building in cities and urban contexts, and why is resilience a regional issue? So. Um, I'll just start with, uh, with a, a, a pretty pragmatic and important point about um, why cities, and that is that the, the cost of inaction is too high. And I'll share some um, uh, statistics, some numbers with you from some of the recent uh, um, storms and, and extreme weather events we've had. So the two hour 
torrential rain event that flooded most of the GTA in July of 2013 caused more than $1 billion in damage. It was the costliest extreme weather event in Ontario's history, and it was the third uh, most costly event weather event in Canada's history. Um, just five months later, we had the ice storm, and that cost the city $106 million, uh, left 300,000 people uh, without power, and cost Toronto Hydro um, well over $12 million in damage. So here's some, these are just some of the kinds of statistics on the economic cost of, of inaction. And, and back to my point about resiliency, focusing on more than preparedness and less on post-recovery. What if we put that kind of money into creating better systems, infrastructure systems that create more security for investment and harness the best of communities uh, to create long-term solutions? Um, a second just really important point is that it's, you know, 80% of Canadians live in cities and, 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 and our regional areas are, are critical to our country as well, but this is where most Canadians live. This is where we can, this is where we can have the greatest uh, uh, damage if we don't act um, from a human cost perspective as well. But there's also the synergies that are created between neighborhoods and in the, in, in the density of our cities where we can find opportunities for uh, collaboration and, and finding some um, uh, ways to maximize our investment to create shared data platforms uh, that help us to uh, create strategies that make sense that are on point. So when we uh, look at research in Florida, for example, where they're you know, starting to go underwater, each municipality along the shoreline was creating different data sets that wasn't created kind of a collective sense of what the problem is. That creates risk for investment. That wasn't helping the uh, municipalities in Florida be able to go to their uh, higher levels of government for support and so on. So um, I think we, cities are places for innovation and opportunity and we need to invest wisely. right into our second set of questions. We're a little bit short for time, so I'm just going to ask if we can hold a pause to the end and if our speakers can just keep an eye on our uh, wonderful timekeeper Cecilia up at the front. So our next question is for Grant. Grant, how do some of the ideas spoken about this evening directly impact Toronto residents in terms of jobs and quality of life? So uh, one of the ideas talked about a lot in economic development is the concept of clusters. Uh, you know, this is where you have uh, many businesses of the same type together sort of form critical masses. So we're fortunate here, we have a strong financial services um, cluster. We certainly have strong uh, growth in clusters like digital media, all sorts of creative industries. Uh, you know, so I think we're doing very well from that point of view. Now what we do know from the research about clusters is that cities that have a strong base of knowledge intensive industries like these clusters are gonna have the best jobs and the best quality of life. So the conversation we're having here in this room today uh, is taking place all over the globe. I mean, this is a competition in terms of, you know, who's going to have the best opportunities is what it boils down to. So we've got some strengths that I think provide us with some, what I call, first mover advantages. We should capitalize on those strengths. As a starting point, I think we would be really smart to formalize our thinking around what I call the resilient sector. And this does really tie in, to some extent, into the, the regional conversation. But in Toronto, we really do have a resilient sector already. We've got world-class professionals. We have engineering, construction management people, environmental and and management consultants, law, finance, all sorts of stuff. We've got some amazing expertise. But we've never really packaged that expertise within that concept. So I think there's actually an interesting opportunity to export our knowledge and capabilities. Sort of the analogy I use for this very quickly is, you may remember it was about seven years ago, remember the marble fell off First Canadian Place? And they reclad the building? So, you know, I worked in that building, I saw them going down that building, it took them a year to do it. So all the work was being done by local construction companies, but the project management and the engineering was being done by specialized firms in the U.S. that had the specialized knowledge. And those were the highest value-added jobs in the approach. So I'm saying we need to be home to some of the, the best high value-added jobs in this process. Thank you. Thank you. 